Hello and welcome back to the Dragonfly Daily. I am your host, Mike Marsh, the product manager of Dragonfly at ORS. You can also find me at Dragonfly Wizard on Twitter. And of course, you can connect with me on LinkedIn or ResearchGate. But please check out the YouTube channel where you will find content like this and other content on how to use Dragonfly. Thanks for watching this video. If you're watching live, you get the benefit of being able to ask questions. If you want to watch live, well, you can uh, always register on our website to watch these live where you can ask questions. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. That way you'll be be notified as soon as the content is posted from the, from that day's lesson and you'll always be up to date. So today's lesson is lesson 25, synchronizing scenes. This will be supportive of correlative workflows. If you look back at the lesson plans and the content that we have delivered so far, you'll see that we've done a number of topics on Dragonfly Basics, image segmentation, image processing, etc. So today's lesson builds on Dragonfly Basics. Today's lesson is 25 layout and scene synchronization. We will be, I believe, in the next few days and next week covering the other image segmentation topics and also diving into some customization with Python. But for today, lesson 25 synchronizing scenes, as always done with Dragonfly 4.0. .1 with a slightly customized version of Dragonfly 4.1 as described in Lesson 6, Customizing Dragonfly. This topic, Synchronizing Scenes, we're going to see that you can have multi-scene, multi-view layouts. And we'll define what a scene is. We'll see that each scene has its own visibility settings. Each scene can have multiple simultaneous views. And the multi-view layout for a scene is initialized by the settings that you have in preferences. You'll find that the camera position, that is the pan position and the rotate, the rotate state and the zoom can be synchronized across scenes. You'll also see that window leveling settings can be synchronized across scenes for the same object. Now let's go ahead and dive into Dragonfly. Actually, before we dive into Dragonfly, I will point out that the data I'm using today is the dual energy data from the Digital Rocks portal. So if we go to Digital Rocks portal and visit uh, this fantastic repository maintained by Masha Bratanovich and colleagues at the University of Texas in the Department of Petroleum Engineering. The data set we're looking at is this data set, Dual Energy Medical CT. This is in carbonate rocks, and these data are contributed by uh, Rodolfo Victor from Petrobras and Masha Pratanovich from the University of Texas. I believe the data sets we're looking at today are this sample, C04B10, and we'll be looking at some of these different samples, the 140 kVp sample, the 110 kVp sample, and also some interpreted uh, elemental analysis, such as the effective atomic number and the effective density. I will point out that when I downloaded this data set and unzipped it, the archive was corrupted and didn't have some of these images. So after I unpacked the archive and I couldn't find some images, I went back into the individual entries. So for example, when I needed the uh, row density, I just clicked through and then downloaded this data set just by clicking download file. The other data I collected just by clicking this button to download the entire archive. So you can grab all those data. You will note that these data, some of them are encoded in 16-bit signed integer, and we showed in an earlier lesson how to import that. And you'll note that some of the data, particularly the interpreted data, such as the density and the atomic number, they are actually encoded in 32-bit real, so that is floating point. And they also have different matrix dimensions 250 by 250 instead of 500 by 500 and you'll see that as soon as I open up the data. So in Dragonfly I've pulled in these four data samples and then put them all in a project. The four samples I have are for that first core, the one at the top of the list, the C04B10. I have the 100 kVp image, the 140 kVp image, and the atomic number and the density. So I'll drag these in turn into my workspace. There's the 100 kVp, there's the 140 kVp, there is the atomic number and there is the density. Now the normal behavior of Dragonfly is to uh, immediately turn on the display for the first data you have loaded so you see that it is visible. The other data are maintained as with the visibility state off until you toggle them on. Now we have these data, we can do a quick look at them. So this is the 100 kVp sample. If I turn on the 140 kVp sample, we can see it overlaid. Now, of course, these layers have some intrinsic opacity, so I'm not seeing the underlying data. If I selected this data set and I turned on the move state, uh, and clicked a view, I could move one data set with respect to the other, and now you can see it. I can also undo my moves. And if I wanted to see the underlying data, I could take the data. Well, first I should point out that 
As I have mentioned once before, this behaves a little bit like a layers. So if I take this and I drag it to a lower layer, now we're looking at the 100 kVp sample. Let's make this a little more obvious. Let's change the colors here. So I'll take the 100 kVp sample and it's currently being rendered in 2D with the grayscale LUT. I'm gonna switch this to the, I'll choose the cyan LUT. And then I will take the 140 kVp sample and I will switch it from the grayscale LUT to a magenta LUT. So now you can see I'm not seeing the magenta sample if I raise it and now I can see it. I also have the ability to turn on alpha intensities. If you happen to look at this lookup table, if you edit this LUT, you'll see that it goes from black to magenta, but it also has an opacity ramp. Instead of going uh, opaque, fully opaque across the entire uh, histogram, you'll see that it has 0% opacity at the left end of the histogram. However, as we have noted once before, the alpha intensities are ignored in the 2D view unless you specifically enable them. So right now, all of these black pixels at low intensity are fully opaque. If I turn on use LUT, now they are transparent and I can see through. So now when I move the selected sample, we can see where one sample is with respect to the other, and we can kind of get an idea if they are aligned or not. That is opposed to this state where it's harder to see through because I don't have any uh, alpha or transparencies enabled. Now, as I showed you, I can undo my translations. We can also zoom in a little bit using a middle mouse to drag and left and right mouse buttons to left and right mouse button drags to pan. So zoom, pan. You guys should all be pros at that by now. And we could also so take the selected image, increase its brightness and uh, we just try and get an idea of if these two data sets are aligned. They're pretty well aligned. We could maybe spend some time trying to optimize the registration, um, but we don't have to worry about it too much. Now, we have two more image channels in our workspace. We have the atomic number and the density. Now, if I turn on the atomic number, we immediately see two things. We see that it's surrounded by this uh, white mask, and we see that it's not aligned with the data set. Now, what I can do is I can uh, do the registration manually. I could take this and I could drag it down at like such and try and position it somewhere in the middle. I don't know the registration. I haven't looked at these data, so I don't know uh, if this is from the center, which makes more sense than it being from the top or the bottom, etc. Now, I could turn on the use alpha LUT, um, but that's not going to help me much because these pixels at the high radius or outside the cylinder are actually encoded as high intensity and so they're being rendered as opaque. So I don't get the benefit of the use LUT. Now I moved this sample and let's say I moved it to approximately the right position. I could turn on this sample and of course we see it's in that other position. Now here's a useful note I don't think we've looked at before. If I right click on this sample, I could go to align and say, I wish to hmm, align, I'm looking for the copy transform, ah, modify and transform. So. Uh, not in the align menu, but in the modify and transform for this data set, I could say apply the transformation from, and then we want to use the same transformation, the same rotation or translation that we manually did on the atomic number, the ZF mean, and hit OK. And now it copies that transformation. So you don't have to manually tune one and then manually tune the other. You can manually tune one and then use the, that precise transformation and apply it directly to the other. So now we have these uh, data sets and they are roughly aligned. And I don't know, actually we could look here and maybe do as well. We could say, oh, you know what? Let's uh, turn on the visibility. Oh, well, actually it's more helpful here. This one looks like I could drag it down so the crack is you know, somewhere in this vicinity. Now, can I copy this transform? Let's uh, turn it on and right click and do copy, apply transformation from row E. I've never tried this to try and concatenate the two transforms. Looks like it worked. So now we have everything in roughly the same orientation or the same frame. Now at this point and pretty much 100% of the lessons so far, we have worked in a single scene. So I'm going to draw your attention to the layout panel now for a minute. So I've got all these data and they're all being viewed in this four panel layout in this scene. So I've got one scene. We haven't talked really much about this at all, but in this one scene, I could have one view or I could have this four quadrant view, which I can always double click to go full screen. Now, 
And I also should note that in preferences, you can tell it that the default scene view could be a single view, which we call the image plane, or it could be a one by three or a two by two. And so I have mine set at two by two. So this is what I get when I choose a new scene. Now, what I'm going to do now is create two scenes side by side. Now, what we have here is on the left, uh, it looks like we have a, uh, an aspect ratio glitch. If I turn off the visibility of everything on the left and then turn it back on, uh, looks like it's still glitching and we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. But, uh, and it's obvious it's, well, oh, no, it's not glitching anymore. Yeah, so it seems to have resolved itself just by turning the visibility on and off. Now, the first thing I'll draw your attention to is over on the left, I have still a four view layout. So I've got four views for this scene. And we know the standard behavior. If I have an image, let's do the 100 KVP sample on the left. If I have an image, then it will, uh, when I turn on its visibility in 2D and when I adjust the brightness and contrast, it, whoops, that's not brightness and contrast. When I adjust the brightness and contrast, it is uh, synchronized uh, across all views in that scene. Now I can have another four view layout on the right, which I could show a completely different data set. So if I choose the scene on the right and I turn on 140 KVP, now we see the 140 KVP. Now immediately you may note that it's in gray instead of magenta, and it turns out those lookup tables are bound to a scene. So this data set, 140 KVP, was only set to be magenta on the left scene. But now we're viewing the 140 KVP sample on the right. And we, as you note, we can change the brightness and contrast, change the brightness and contrast, and it's synchronized across the scene. Now if on the right I turn on the 100 KVP sample, now we're looking at exactly the same sample, but we're looking at it on the right with its own lookup table settings, and it could be its own zoom and pan, or we could synchronize. So we now are in a two layout view, I should say a two scene layout, where each scene has four views. Now over on the left, I could uh, find the panel for scene view synchronization, and, uh, oh, that's scene view orientation. Scene views synchronizer is what I want, so we'll expand this. Now, I can take my view on the left, and I could say I want to synchronize zoom. Now, because I had this view selected when I turned on this checkbox, this becomes a driver. And now, if I zoom in this view, it will drive the partner uh, scene. I could also uh, do position, which would also be slice position. I could also do window leveling if it's the same data set. So the data set on the left and the data set on the right are both the 100 KVP sample. So as I change the brightness, it'll change the brightness and contrast of both. Now, uh, this might be more useful if I double click on the left to make it go full screen and then double click on the right. So now I will again choose the left view and I'll uh, zoom and I can now scroll through the data and I can look at this now it's not very useful right now because I'm looking at exactly the same sample but if on the right I now turn on the 140 KVP sample now I can scroll and I can look at the data and on the left I'm looking at the 100 KVP sample so I select the left and you see 100 KVP sample is all that is visible on the left and I select the right and we see 140 KVP sample is all that is visible on the right. So this does allow me to, uh, to translate and to zoom. I can change the brightness and contrast on the left I can change the brightness and contrast on the right, but they're not synchronized because they're two different samples. So this does give you a way of comparing different images and doing inspection. So we know that we can overlay images in the same view, but we can also uh, synchronize images across views as we're doing here. Now, the view on the left is the view where I click these checkboxes. And basically, when you click these checkboxes, that view becomes a driver, and the other view will be a slave to that driver. If I click on the view on the right, you'll see that it is not checked. These boxes are not checked. So if I drag over here, or I pan, or I change slice position, it's not synchronizing. I can come over here and start synchronizing, and boom, it starts driving this view. Or I can come over here and also select zoom and position. And now both views will drive the other view. So whichever view I click in, it will now drive in a synchronized slave. So that allows us to do this for 2D views. Now if I double click out and double click the 3D view and do the same thing over here, double click and then choose the 3D view, 
Now over on the left, I'm looking at a 3D view of the 100 kVp sample, so I can adjust the brightness and contrast, find something maybe useful. Okay, and on the right, I can adjust the brightness and contrast of that sample. And what we have here is we have this uh, same position. So basically, if in the 2D views I turned on that uh, position, then it will also be checked for the 3D view, and so now these 3D views are synchronized. Now I can still change everything I want. So on the view on the left, I could select this sample and choose a different 3D lookup table or different opacity or anything else. And then I can do the same thing for the right. So this is almost like having two different Dragonfly sessions open, each with its own 3D view uh, with its own visibility and settings, but I can use one view to drive the other view. So that is the behavior of synchronization. You can create multiple scenes, that are synchronized and each scene can have one or more views. Now you will note that in the current Dragonfly architecture you can only maintain three scenes um, and so I could put three scenes together and have three 3D views or three 2D views or three quadrant views. We do support all of that. If you find yourself in a need for more than three scenes, then contact us. We've not wanted to introduce too much complication into the architecture and put buttons and features that we don't need to support because no one's ever going to use. But if you do have use cases where you'd like to look at more scenes, we'd like to hear about that. So I think that covers everything I wanted to show today on taking care of scene synchronization. I will do one more thing. I will imp open the organizer and let's see, is this the organizer? And I will, you, you'll, you'll note that I did some translations. I translated this sample a little bit and then I translated both of these samples. If I now click update all objects, it will take the current state of all these objects and then put them into the organizer. So next time I drag these, next time I drag these out of the organizer, they have, uh, will have this state. That is, they will have been translated and aligned to approximately the right position. I could spend more time doing volume registration and try and get a fine-tuned sub-pixel registration. Today I just did a very coarse manual translation, but that information is now encoded in the image and it will be there next time I pull these objects from the organizer. So that is it. Now let's turn to questions and answers. Thank you for your attention. Let's see, we do have a couple of questions in the queue. Question, can a scene be detached from the main Dragonfly window so it can be displayed on a second monitor? Uh, no, we don't currently support that. So um, in the architecture, all of your views are sort of locked in the middle here. Now you can take all of your control panels and undock them and put them on another monitor and then use the view to take up the full screen, but we don't have the capability of putting these views on two different screens. I mean, you could do something clever and put it on one screen and then uh, drag it across two monitors where the interface between the two monitors lines up with this seam, but I'm sure that's not what you're talking about. So short answer is no. Um, and if there were a case we could look at it, it's, it's not a big architectural change for us to create one of the scenes as a floating window. Um, maybe you could email collaborate at theobjects.com and give us a use case to collaborate on so then that would uh, uh, encourage us to implement the feature and then make a video showing the use case with your data. So uh, think about that. Always collaborations are a, a very good way of engaging us to implement features. Of course, if you have the product and you've purchased the product, then we're always uh, more eager to listen to your suggestions because uh, money makes the team and pays the programmers to get stuff done. So next question, can you synchronize scenes and take 2D movies of both scenes synchronized? Well, uh, let's see, no and yes. I mean, what I can do is I can put this uh, back in this 2D view and double click here and put this in a 2D view. Now, these are synchronized, so if I came over here and I turned on 2D animation and just started playing the one on the left, then it is driving the one on the left, which is in turn driving the one on the right. Now, the movie function, the record function, is only going to record the one that is selected. So it's not going to record both. Now you could set this up and say, okay, that's way too fast. Let's put this down at 10 frames per second. You could set up this one minute movie and say, this is what I want to record. And then you could use another screen recorder tool. I think there's even one free with Windows, at least there was with Windows 7. And then you could set it to record this area of the screen and it would capture both. But the Dragonfly screen recorder will only capture one view at a time. So that's why I say a bit of yes, a bit of no. Um, but great question. Now let's uh, go back over and pull up the Q&A panel. Uh, next 
question. If you have two images with different voxel size, can you synchronize their zoom ratio and slice number by using the real scale, for example, in microns? Well, yes, you could, uh, but it's not obvious how. So uh, since you asked, I think I can show you that answer. Let's uh, actually, you know, I think it actually works uh, by default. Let's see what happens. I'm going to take my 140 kvp sample and I'm going to resample it on the z so that it's only 100 slices thick. So the sample on the left is going to be 758 slices thick, the sample on the right is going to be 100 slices thick. So go to sample and I'm going to make it uh, 100 slices thick and we will click uh, cubic and uh, apply. Okay now this data set is 100 slices thick but it knows that the slices have a well I'm, I'm, not, I'm fumbling for words but basically over here on the left I will decrement from 535 to slice uh, 534 this did not go down because 535 and 534 are both coincident with slice 71 so as I scroll down it's using the hmm, maybe if I do it this way it'll be more obvious so I'll zoom out here okay and if you look at this, hmm, that's a <laughs> that's a little off on the left. That's a bit of a bug, I guess. But uh, you can draw your attention to this view down at the bottom. As I drag here, uh, it is um, going to the right position. Um, so now I'm at the bottom of my core on both sides. So it is moving in the millimeter scale, not in the slice by slice scale. Now I don't know what would happen if I came over here and I uh, told this to play. You know. I th think it still works. Yeah, so it knows scale. Dragonfly knows where you are. It almost always operates in the real world coordinate system as opposed to the lattice coordinate system. So we know that this might be slice one and this is slice one and this is slice 758 and this at the very bottom is slice 100 but it also knows that you know this is a whatever a two foot core and slice 100 over here is two feet depth and slice 758 is two is two feet depth so it normally operates in that real world coordinate system of dimensions rather than the lattice coordinate system so it just solves those problems natively the way the software should so i think that answered that question all right next question i realize the organizer requires separate licensing how can we find out about pricing <laughs> wow Someone wants to buy something from me? I, I guess now the uh, Dragonfly Daily is a success. So certainly you may always email sales at theobjects.com and we'll happy to give you pricing information. The organizer pricing's uh, not too expensive and I think it comes as a multi-pack. So if you buy it once, it's valid for multiple Dragonfly licenses because you, know, you are able to take advantage of it and use it uh, use you know one organizer library on another on one computer and maybe uh, connect to the organizer library on another computer so you'll find that the license enables multiple dragonflies but anyway the pricing just email sales at the objects.com and my colleague Bill or my colleague Zishong depending on what territory you're in will take your email and then tell you what the pricing options are for you and your organization okay uh, we don't have any more questions um, I think you'll find that Dragonfly is a fantastic solution for correlative image analysis. Mostly because of my answer to that last question. You're always operating in the real world coordinate system. That means you can correlate images that have different pixel sizes and collected from different modalities, etc. So you do have a terrific environment for overlaying images and synchronizing their views and doing image fusion and using the segmentation of one to inform the segmentation of another. So I hope you enjoyed today's lesson and if you ever embark on correlative image studies you can take advantage of these features all right we'll be back tomorrow thanks everyone take care stay healthy and uh, be good to each other bye bye everybody